Well, good morning all. Welcome to our 10 o'clock service here at St James. You know, last night I was looking at the NRL scoreboard and I saw my great team Bulldogs at the bottom. And apparently we haven't even won a game at all this year. And I thought, wow, aren't we a humble team? You know, we wanted other teams to be up in the first four places and we thought, we'll just take the wooden spoon. We'll take the four for the great, greatest for the good, you know? And I thought, that's great being humble. And that's the way I see it. <laughs> but being humble, it'd be great for us to be humble this morning. We've had a very busy week and we're probably thinking about a very busy week ahead of us. So it'd be good to just humble our hearts and minds before God. God is our Lord, he's our King and he's our Saviour. And we need to remember that and to be humble before him. So before we um, um, sing some songs, I'd like to um, pray, and then we can start the service. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, just do thank you so much for your love um, you have for us, Lord. Father, we just pray that uh, uh, just settle our hearts and minds to focus on you as we sing these songs of um, great um, praises to you, Lord. Um, may it lift up our hearts and our spirit to you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for Graham being here today to um, present your word. And Father, allow us to hear his word and to find out how we can apply it to our lives to serve you better and to even to share um, the teachings um, to those um, that you want us to um, share with, Lord. So Father, we also pray for those who can't be here today, Lord, that um, whatever they're doing, whether they're homesick or out travelling, Lord, that you just keep them safe and well and be with them always. Amen. We're going to sing two wonderful songs. First is Nothing But The Blood Of Jesus followed by the cornerstone. Please stand.
Barry's going to come up for announcements. Thank you, Barry. Morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, yesterday, I'd like to thank everybody who came to our working bee. It was a great day. We got a lot done inside the rectory painting, and um, it was really good fellowship. The only problem was the um, morning... Um, tea and all that was so good from Robin and uh, Barbie that uh, I had to get the whip out after that to get them back to work. <laughs> so it was very thanks for doing that. And um, we're looking forward to having another working bee to finish off painting and so forth. So it would be great if other people could come. Um, special men's breakfast is on the 1st of May. And our guest speaker is David Hartley, Hadley, I should say. And uh, he's um, going to speak to us about his experience in the military. So that'll be great to hear. So men, please note that date. And also Anzac Day, David also will be giving his testimony about how to be a Christian witness in the military service. So uh, that'd be great. So please come to that. Thanks. From Titus chapter 2, looking at verses 11 to um, 14, it says this. 
For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and, and worldly passions, and to live self-control, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all unlawlessness and to purify himself a people for his own, possessed who are zealous for good works. We're going to have our time of, um, of confession and before I we'll continue on, I'll just spend one minute, just think about our lives, just think about um, what um, we could have done better um, and obviously where we've um, upset our Lord because he knows our hearts and um, there's nothing that we can hide from him. The Bible tells us not to hide our sins from God, our Heavenly Father, but to confess them with a repentant and obedient heart so that we may be forgiven through his boundless goodness and mercy. We ought to admit our sins to God at all times, and especially when we come together like this, to give thanks for the benefits we have received from him, to offer the praise that is due to him, to hear his holy word, and to ask him to supply whatever we need. So let us approach the throne of our gracious God with a true heart and full assurance of faith and pray together. Merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the schemes and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who repent according to the promise declared to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that from now on we may live godly and obedient lives to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God desires that no one should perish, but all should turn to Christ and live. We confess our sins in response to his call. God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. Teach us through your word and equip us for every good work for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to have our two um, Bible readings now. Um, the first will be the Old Testament from Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 18, and then it will be Matthew chapter 13, 1 to 17. Um, I think it's Jacqueline, Jacqueline, yep. And then Tina will follow. Thank you. Thank you. As Craig has already said, the Old Testament reading is from Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 18. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, 
that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Morning. Um, first, uh, New Testament readings, Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 to 17. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and he sowed, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no, no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's hearts grow dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. This is the word of the Lord. Morning, Graham. How are you feeling today? All inspired to preach? It's your turn now. first time I've had a service like this in this place. I've done quite a number of services here, both uh, back in June, July of last year when it was an empty church and then around Christmas time where we thought we were getting somewhere and then the northern beaches sort of happened and curtailed things a bit. So just to sort of see this and have people singing around us and music sounding good, it's really, and, and a tr- I didn't know we had a trumpet. I mean, it's brilliant. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that um, that you, the Lord Jesus gave us uh, teaching which challenges us to think about the kingdom and challenges us to think about your ways in the world. Help us to apply our minds to that and to understand better something of what you are doing and therefore what we need to do in response. And we pray those things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was first thinking about this sermon... <clears throat> Um, I just discovered that um, 
uh, the, face, the, the Facebook page of my old primary school. And uh, I was reveling in reading about things of long ago. It's no surprise, I, I guess, that as I started to think about parables, a memory from a scripture class of those far off days came to mind. Just turned off, thanks. <coughs> Our Church of England teacher in infant school was an old lady named, uh, and she was in a, in a navy coloured uniform with a kind of squash version of a Mary Poppins hat, um, no flower. And she told us her name was Deaconess. Very strange name for a seven year old to cope with. One day, Deaconess asked us what a parable was. Vicky Worrell, smarty pants, put up her hand and said, Oh, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And you would have thought that she just recited the entire Sermon on the Mount by half. Deaconess was so wonderfully impressed. Well, good answer, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> now, as another kid, that told me nothing about what a parable actually was. I think it was a bit too profound. Um, I was none the wiser. But what it did give me was a cutesy formula for, get, for getting bonus credit with whoever was in charge of things. And so you'll appreciate how puzzled and crestfallen I was at Sunday school sometime later when one of the teachers asked that very same question. And I trotted out the formula that was a, a gold star guaranteed for kudos, only to be told, oh, that's a baby answer. Uh, what is a parable? Tell me what it actually is. Now, entirely the right thing to do, but pss, it put the pin in the balloon of my hopes for that lesson. Jesus' followers, we see in today's Bible reading, had no trouble recognising a parable when they saw it. They could spot a parable a mile off. The rabbis they'd heard since their childhood days used parable after parable in their teaching. But as they listened to Jesus' teaching here in Matthew 13, they suddenly find a problem, something I just can't understand. What is it? Well, to answer that question, we have to ask another one. Was this the first time they'd heard him teach? The simple answer is no. If you go back to the start, to when Jesus had done, first started preaching, what do you find? You find John the Baptist um, up there. Sorry, what do you find? You find John the Baptist being arrested, sorry. And John the Baptist's message had earlier on been, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John is gone, Jesus steps up into the plate, and what does he preach? Repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Of course, that isn't all he said. It would have been a blessed short sermon if he had. But uh, that's the essence. That's the guts of it. And in Luke, we get a slightly different angle on that, where Jesus is, is preaching very early in his, in his time in the synagogue at Nazareth. He reads a passage from the prophet Isaiah. And it's a passage where Isaiah is preaching, is predicting sorry, the coming of God's specially chosen deliverer. And of course realised there was no confusion amongst the Jews on that point. No controversy that that is what Isaiah was actually on about when he was, preach when he was uh, prophesying. Jesus reads it and says to them, look, what Isaiah says here is actually happening here. Now, we read that from Luke 4 and we say, yep, that's right. But of course there... Uh, in that context, amongst those people at that time, this is whack over the head challenging stuff. And of course, what's more, by now, oftentimes Jesus' message isn't just words alone. John the Baptist's powerful words had really been saying to people, the kingdom of heaven is so close you can taste it, you can smell it, it's virtually on top of you. And Jesus preaches the kingdom like John, but he does more as well. There are miracles of healing at the same time, not just one or two. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, brilliant. And um, it, it's just not just one or two. Everyone around about just gets healed. He heals them all. That's the gist of it all. Nothing stops the kingdom. John never did anything like that. And the disciples are there seeing all of this as well. And Jesus' popularity just goes through the roof, quite literally, in on one occasion. Slide off, thanks. But then something different happens. Very obvious, very stark in Matthew's Gospel. The Sermon on the Mount happens. 
empty. Crowds come again. The disciples are there, front and centre. And remember, of course, that Jesus had more disciples than just the twelve. We can be very sure about that because even though it's not something Matthew is so clear on, Luke is. Um, just a bit later on in his ministry, Jesus sends the twelve out two by two uh, with the job of preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing. But then a little later, he sends out 70 or 72, depending on the version you're looking at, with the same brief and the same results. So although we tend to think of the disciples as being this bunch of 12 guys, that 12 was the core of a larger, more fluid group of followers. So here's Jesus up on the mountain, and the crowds come, and the disciples are there, and he teaches, and he teaches, and he teaches, and it is great stuff. And now it is more than just a basic call to repent. Slide back on again, thanks. And as he speaks, he's opening things up to the disciples in a broader, deeper way, a much broader, deeper way than they've ever understood before. They're challenged. They're profoundly challenged. Now, it must have been like that for the disciples because our understanding and appreciation of God's ways is profoundly challenged by the Sermon on the Mount. And we aren't even Jews with a Pharisee's rule book understanding of things drummed into us from our youngest days like they were. Slide off again, thanks. By the time that sermon was over, they must have been fairly buzzing on the inside. I mean, you know the experience, don't you? The feeling you have when you hear a sermon or maybe you've read it in the Bible for yourself and it's like the scales fall from your eyes. You've read this before, you've heard this before, but suddenly you are realising things you just hadn't seen before. It may not even seem all that special when you tell other people what you've just heard or just found out or just discovered, but for you, it's a eureka moment. Wow! Wow! Well, look at the Sermon on the Mount and those sorts of wow moments must have been coming thick and fast for the disciples that day. But what doesn't happen up there on the mountain that day? What's been a part of Jesus' ministry, his popular ministry up until now, but is completely missing when you go through Matthews 5, 6 and 7, the Sermon on the Mount? Well, you can work that one out, can't you? Miracles don't happen. Before, prior to this, healing upon healing upon healing, but they're just not there in the Sermon on the Mount. Nothing. Now, we're not told this. You can disagree with me if you want. But I'm kind of guessing some folks must have been looking forward to the sight and sound spectacular and gone home disappointed that day. The Bible says nothing about that, so I may be wrong. And even if I'm not wrong... It can't be that big a deal in terms of what Matthew wants to say, but it makes sense. And it especially helps to make sense of that question we wondered about a minute ago. Why do the disciples come with that query about parables in Matthew 13? Because up to this particular point, so much of what Jesus has been doing has been to attract people's attention and to make things clearer for his listeners. But now, as he stands in that little boat and teaches about the kingdom, it almost seems like he's teaching in riddles. When you preach a sermon on the mount, you notice, the only questions of any sort that get asked are rhetorical ones that Jesus himself asked as part of his teaching. But here, a bit later on, when he comes to teach and teaches about the kingdom of heaven, he barely gets going. One parable out and the disciples are in his face. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? the momentum of what's been going on, what's been going on around the country, uh, has been rolling, rolling, building, building more and more, people on side, people keen, people enthusiastic, and now all of a sudden, Jesus almost seems to be trying to put people off. If you guys see what I'm saying, then for goodness sake, take it on board, he tells them. In other words, he who hears to hear, let him hear, is the Bible's Bible speak way of saying it. He's just told the parable of the sower. And the disciples themselves, when that parable comes to an end, can't see what the heck Jesus is talking about with the parable. They probably see the head scratching and puzzlement on people's faces, and they are thinking, does Jesus know what he's doing here? Well, of course, the answer is he does. 
And the series of parables he then goes on to tell, some get explained and some don't, often called the parables of the kingdom, are really opening out for them and for us too what actually is going on, both on that occasion and on down through the ages with the kingdom. Up to this point, Jesus has just been putting out the message. The kingdom is here. Do something about it. The long promised time for God's rule over his people to be, to be set up, to be established, has now arrived. And to Jesus' listeners, this, this was good news. It was exciting news. They'd read the book of Daniel. It was our Old Testament reading from chapter 7 when the, the kingdom comes and, and it's very spectacular. The king, and, and chapter 3 in Daniel is a bit like that too. The king's you know, statue dream with all the layers of the statue and then this stone that wasn't carved by a human hand smashes the statue to bits and the stone grows and fills the whole earth. The people had a vague idea as to what that meant and it was a kingdom thing and they were on board in a big way. But... As you'll know, I suspect, their ideas about kingdom, about God's promised rule in this world and how it kicks off, their expectations are quite different from the reality. And lest we get too cocky about it, I think there are still things about the kingdom that we get wrong because they cut against the grain of what we want to expect. I want to whip through a couple of uh, some of the parables that Jesus um, speaks of. Um, it's a pity we don't have time for the whole lot, but um, some of them. Things the disciples uh, needed to see, things that we need to see about God's way in the world, the way of God's kingdom in the world. In the parable of the sower, notice, the main point really is not everyone who hears Jesus' words is going to respond in a way that counts. It had looked like everything was rolling on, everyone was on side. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Not everyone who seems to respond, who looks like they're going great guns, has actually responded in a way that counts. And even amongst those whose response is a good one, there is variation, there is difference. Notice at the end, the very last part of the parable, he says... Uh, the good soil, some give a hundred and some give this and some give that. There is variation in, in the response you get to the kingdom, even amongst those who are doing the right thing. Disciples then and disciples now need to take that idea on board as a guard against discouragement. The kingdom, as we experience it in this world, is not a steamroller. And did you notice this also in the parable? The problem is not with the message. This variation, as Jesus tells the parable, happens uh, when it's the same sort of seed that falls in each place. It's nothing wrong with the message in Jesus' parable. The Apostle Paul puts that thought a bit more prosaically when he says, look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. It ain't magic, but it's Powerful for those who respond the right way. People might carry on as though they're on side with us, is in effect what Jesus is saying, but they're not. And a lot of people are going to disappoint you. Don't be discouraged. That's the way the kingdom is. Next slide, thanks. Then he tells them the parable of the wheat and the weeds, whereas the older versions have it, the wheat and the tares. Strange name, tares, but it actually is a more helpful one in the long run because tares, many of you might know, are a specific sort of weed that looked almost identical to wheat in the early stages. And it's only when it starts to mature that you begin to notice that there is something different about it. Evidently, back in those days, it wasn't an unknown thing uh, if a couple of farmers were having a bit of a squabble for one to eventually start to realise that there was something fishy about his crop. Something hokey was going on. Been sabotaged with bodgy seed. But because it was a maturity thing, you couldn't always be 100% sure of the dividing line between the two, the good stuff and the not-so-good stuff, the good stuff and the, <coughs> the imitation. And it wasn't till harvest time that you could work out which was which. So you just had to wait. 
a wise old minister I once worked with, a former missionary, when the uh, fellowship kids got all excited, oh, someone says he's become a Christian, would put on his best deadpan face and say, oh, well, time will tell. Not everybody appreciated, slide off again, thanks. Not everybody appreciated it when he said it like that. But we didn't forget it either. Lessons learnt working long years in India had put legs onto the wisdom of Jesus' parable. Next slide. Jesus explains a bit more about the kingdom with the parable of the mustard seed. Mustard seed's a very small seed, the smallest seed that folks listening to Jesus knew about. But over time, and notice time again, another feature of all these parables just about, over time it could become a healthy, good-sized shrub. And that was a good word, word of warning for anyone, whether we're talking about people then or people now. When it, comes to God, when it comes to God being at work in the world, we all want to see things happening right from the start. And the disciples did. They were seeing things happening. And, and they actually thought big things going on was the way it was supposed to be. And Jesus is really putting the brakes on their expectations by telling them that's not the way to expect things to happen in the kingdom of heaven. But that little word picture Jesus has given doesn't stop there. No, not at all. Uh, as well as dampening down their over-the-top uh, expectations, there is encouragement as well. The penny didn't drop with me uh, with this particular parable for a long time. I, I, I could never really make sense of that last bit where he says, so the birds of the air come and make their nests in its branches. Think about that. What the birds usually do with seeds. We've just seen it in the parable of the sower, haven't we? They eat them. They remove them from the picture. But not this seed. The kingdom of heaven grows and grows stronger and bigger so that the very creatures that once would have wanted nothing more than to end its existence now actually benefit. Their lives are better because of the presence of the kingdom of heaven. What would the wider world, the very forces of which we're going to kill Jesus in a couple of years' time, and try and stamp out the preaching of the gospel by the apostles, what would the wider world, our world, be like if those attempts had been successful? Benefits, standards that our society simply takes for granted, but in fact have their roots in the gospel. Nesting birds, not part of the tree, but they benefit from it. Uh, slide off for that one, thanks. Um, the kingdom parable that comes straight after that one is kind of similar, but it's not identical. Uh, it's the parable of the leaven, the yeast. New slide, thanks. We often miss out on the force of what Jesus is saying here because I, I suspect we're imagining something like the loaf of bread we get from our kitchen bread makers, if you've got a kitchen bread maker. Evidently, though, uh, in those days, measures were a bit wobbly from place to place. You know, nowadays, if you're in one country, you might use imperial, and in another country, you might use metric, but at least the different amounts have different names. Back there, you could move from place to place, place and have the same name for a volume, and it didn't quite match the same volume over here. But um, the lower limit, the lower limit of the volume of flour the woman in Jesus' story mixes up is about 22 litres. But going on what some other ancient writers say was the volume in their part of the world, it could have been as many as 40. So whatever amount in that range it has in mind, this is no simple dollop of dough we're talking about. The next thing to pick up in that parable is this, and it's a detail the NIV makes a bit harder for us to see if you have an NIV in front of you, I think because it speaks of a woman mixing yeast into flour. Now, that makes sense. That's what you'd expect to do. But when you notice that some other versions have translated as hiding this small lump of yeast inside the flour, you think, huh? But check it out, and sure enough, that is actually the word. So here's the picture. Undetected, unseen, buried somewhere in a bathtub full of flour lies this little bit of yeast. You'd never even know it was there. But slowly, there's that time thing again, quietly, 
and yet effectively it does its work. It spreads, never particularly causing widespread attention to itself, but moving and going and changing. The third thing that this parable touches on comes at the very end. All is leavened. I read that and I thought, I guess, the words of the Old Testament prophet when he said, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. While a kingdom in its own gradual, quiet way, not even noticed by most who are looking, who are looking at things, while the kingdom is growing, it is changing things. It is having an effect that is way, way bigger than what its beginnings and its gentle sort of power would have ever suggested. The slide off again. There's still three more parables that I'd love to work through as well, but time isn't on our side for that. You'd be, you'd be throwing things at me. So remember what we, did, what we said at the start, though. The disciples are, seeing, uh, disciples are seeing these great crowds that have come to Jesus. And they say to him, why? Why the parables? And Jesus' answer, in essence, really is, because the kingdom isn't what they want. Only those who want the kingdom are worthy of the kingdom. Most folks, if they understood it truly, if they really saw what the kingdom actually was, will say, is that what it is? Forget that, I don't want that. For all their shortcomings, the disciples at least come to him and say, explain the parable to us. What does it mean? Why does this happen? Why does that happen? In asking questions like that, they're showing that they have at least the beginnings of wanting it. They're starting to want what the kingdom really is. Jesus doesn't demand immediate perfection, so what's true of the kingdom on a worldwide scale is also true on a personal, individual scale as well. Submission to God's rule is not complete yet in any of us. But it should be headed in the right direction. It should be growing. It'll be gradual, it won't be overnight. It takes time, that's the way of the kingdom. Um, slide on again, thanks. But whatever setbacks may come in that growth, they won't be, there won't be a chucking in of the whole thing. If I can trail the coat just a, a little bit, this is not just a Matthew's Gospel thing. Check it out in Luke and you'll see constantly Jesus is setting up barriers when would-be followers say, I'm on side, I'm on side, I'm coming, I'm coming. Jesus puts a barrier up. Do they really want the kingdom? Just a couple of examples there. In John, which is the last of the, of the examples on the, uh, on the screen, you'll see Jesus pushing hard on the implications that his miracles mean for those who say that they are followers. What the so-called signs in John are pointing to. And, uh, and they start saying, is this what you're talking about? Not for me. In the book of Acts, we don't have that reference. Um, in the book of Acts, we see Paul going around the Mediterranean planting churches in his first journey, and after he's finished that first journey, he goes back and revisits all those churches, and the gist of his message is, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. The question for us then is, are we on board for God's kingdom? Not God's kingdom as we imagine it to be. It means patience, it means trusting, it means trusting that he's still got things in hand. And it means realising that so much of what our general experience, what the world around, around us conditioned us to expect and taught us, taught us to think is the way things are supposed to be uh, when things are going good is not the way things really are. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus both proclaimed and established your kingdom. We thank you that the growth of that kingdom is not something that's dependent upon us, but is done in the power of your spirit. But we recognise also that as the kingdom grows, there is uh, opposition as well. And we look forward to that day when the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Help us to look forward to that with a great heart. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, thank you for that, Graham. Um, once again, uh, that morning tea, if you've got any questions or anything you'd like to ask Graham, he's more than welcome to talk to you and, and answer any of those questions. Uh, but on the theme of the kingdom, we're going to sing a really good song, Let Your Kingdom Come. So I love to hear those voices. Billing out to God with joy and thanksgiving. Please stand. The Lord be with you. We're going to have our um, time in prayer, and Lindra is going to come up and lead us in prayer. And I was just thinking what Graham was preaching about the kingdom of God that um, if Jesus didn't die on the cross, and if Jesus didn't resurrect from the dead, then all this would be meaningless. There will be no kingdom of God. And in our time in prayer, we'd be praying to nobody. So it's so wonderful to know that the gospel that we know is true and correct, that Jesus did die on the cross, that Jesus did um, rise from the dead, and that he's live and living and he's listening to our prayers right now. <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, precious Lord and Saviour, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your heavens are the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. 
You love this world and all that's in it. Heavenly Father, there is war and persecution of your people in so many areas of this world. We pray that the leaders of these countries look away from themselves and the power they seek and do what is right and just for their peoples. Be with the countrymen of such lands that know you as their Lord and Saviour. Keep them safe and free from persecution so that they may have time and opportunity to look to you for comfort and peace and to tell others of your love for each and every one on this planet. I thank you for organisations such as Barnabas Fund who venture into these war-torn areas and dangerous countries to strengthen and encourage your people and to provide whatever support they are able. Please keep these workers safe and sustained during their endeavours. I thank you, Lord, for those who have ventured out into the world to tell others of your love. And today I especially pray for the Fultons in Arman Land. Give them, all, give, their, give them faith, health and strength to do what you've called them to do. Heavenly Father, I pray for the family of St James that we will all learn more of you and look to you to reveal your will for us, both as a church and as individuals. I ask you to be with those people who are seeking to find a new leader for St James, that you will lead them to the, the right person. Help us, Lord, to live our lives in a godly fashion and to be aware of the gifts of the Spirit for which we have been gifted and use these gifts to your glory. Precious Lord, there are many people known to us that are sick, depressed, lonely or in some way struggling. Please be with them and give them healing and the peace and the knowledge that you are with them always and that you are in control. Today I especially pray for Brian Peacock, Peter Riley, Craig Homans, Chris and Terry Maroney, Nell Wilding, Bill Osborne, Graham Nose, Dawn and Ruan Andrews, Donald Howard, Angus St John Viney and Ray and Colleen Burge. Show us how we should reach out to them and assist them in their time of need. And we'll just take a moment to pray for those close to our hearts who are at this time experiencing difficulties. And finally, I humbly, humbly pray that you will assist us throughout this week to hear us, to help us hear your word, that we may know and speak the truth and obey your word, that we may honour you in all we do. Deliver us from all that is false and renew us by your spirit, that we may know life in all its fullness. I ask all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <coughs> We'll now say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Use our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. That wasn't my back, by the way. <laughs> Actually, I, I do thank you for the prayers for me. For, uh, the operation has been a great success on my back and with the spine. And um, so much better. I couldn't believe how much pain over 30 years I had with my back. So um, I do appreciate that and thank you very much. Um, I wouldn't mind if you'd like to pray for my brother Glenn. Um, because he had a stage 3 prostate cancer, he's now discovered he's got one of his kidneys got stage three cancer as well. So he's getting knocked around pretty harsh. And um, yeah, I think he's struggling um, quite a bit. Old say to light print, you say to dark print. Be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory come Keep our nations under your care. And us in justice Let your way be known on earth. 
send out your light and truth. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Lord, We're going to sing our final song. May the mind of Christ. Um, I do give great thanks for people who were able to um, present offertory through um, EFT to the bank. Um, but if you've also got your envelopes, we've still got the tray at the back um, behind Barry. Um, you can drop there as well. Um, we're always thankful what the Lord does for us. And, um, and obviously the church is very thankful for what funds are available to um, keep this place going and, and meeting the needs. So please stand as we sing this song, May the Mind of Christ. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by, the, by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this week in love to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And if you'd like to say the grace and look at one another. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be of us all evermore. Amen. Um, please stay uh, for morning tea.